once again we caution you. These stories are definitely not for the timid soul. So we tell you calmly and very sincerely, if you frighten easily, turn off your radio now. Intellectual decay! Turn it off and rot your brain! Oh, the Paramans are just a typical American family. The only thing they're missing is a pet. But have we got a surprise for them? You see, Stanley Putterman's new satellite TV has just gone on the blink. And it's drawn in a creature from outer space. Like all new pets, this one's causing a little trouble around the house. And he's eating the Putterman's out of house and home. In fact, it seems like this creature will eat anything. Well, just about anything. She looked right at my studs and cooled out. This dude's into metal! Now, it's up to the kids to break the creature of its bad habits. I said shut up! But he's not responding well to discipline. Earth children, please, I mean you no harm. I am Plutha, here to save you. The Padamans finally got themselves a pet, but they never even had a chance to give it a name. Terror Vision from Empire Pictures. This is the Bonus Material Podcast. I'm Tom Carnell. I'm Heather Buckley. Back from Fantastic Fest. Nice, nice. Welcome back. We missed you, of course. Uh, uh, Tonight we're going to talk about rites of passage films, in that not films where the character undergoes a rite of passage, but where the viewer goes through a rite of passage. Films you, you should see to develop your horror cred. Does that make sense? It doesn't make sense to me. And, of course, there's two, as we were just discussing a little offline, that there's two ways of uh, looking at it. There's specific films that would filter into making or appreciating genre. Mm-hmm. But even beyond that, there's sort of an expansive view about all good film to be watched does mm-hmm. influence genre, well, I think even to- though it's not directly. I think to talk about all film is a little broad, but I I do believe that even if you're a genre filmmaker, you should fill your palette with as much as possible. And I've seen even um, films that were straight up drama have moments of horror in them that could easily be lifted. You know, um, uh, look at the scene in uh, we talked about in our previous podcast uh, from Sometimes a Great Notion where the brother is trapped under the log and. It's, a, it's in a drama scene, but it's horrific, and it's really um, something that that kind of a thing could easily be lifted and used in horror. Because remember, Pablo Picasso said, genius is the ability to hide who you steal from. And we're all thieves, right? We are all thieves. So. And if we listen to Alan Moore, he says what we create is propaganda, and we can't help but all create propaganda. Yeah, I think with, with, our, with our work, we try to bring someone over to our way of thinking or our way of seeing the world, right? The, the writer does, the creator does, the, the person who's putting scene to scene to scene. They're, they have a perspective whether they want to have it or not. It's, it's inherent in who you are. We are evangelical, and I think the more evangelical we are and the more convincing we can be when it comes to any art form, mm. uh, the better experience for the audience. And some of the things we're talking about are not things that, you know, are are keys to being um, allowed through the gates, things like Star Wars and Raiders of the Lost Ark and, and uh, you know, even things like Breakfast Club or Jaws, you know, they were films that you need to see, but they're not what we're talking about. They're not that sort of, oh, shit moment that you have in the cinema where you realize that you're going to leave the theater a different person than you were when you went in. 
the films you just mentioned, I have to say, talking to directors are movies that they consider to be rites of passage to decide to make horror of a certain generation. It's Good. sort of the, Spiel, the Spielberg Amlin cycle. Yeah. Star Wars has been repeated uh, many times. I mean, for my end, the most repeated to the point that I want to say, what are your favorite horror films that are not The Shining and The Exorcist? <laughs> those would probably, for genre fans, be your first two rites of passage. Because interviewing people for six years or more, that is what I've heard. Mm. And then yeah. recently, Critters 2. Just, and then I've heard that more <laughs> at Fantastic Fest. It's like, yes, Critters 2! Critters 2 is a rite of passion, passage film. Oh, absolutely. Especially when you're a kid and you're growing yes. up and you're making your bones, you know, trying to, to see what you like and what appeals to you and... Uh, a lot of that stuff left me cold, so when I hear people that like yourself that enjoy that kind of thing, I go, okay, I get it, because there's plenty of stuff on my like list that other people scratch their head at. I was taken aback by Critters, too, and I actually um, interviewed, and it'll be up in, on uh, Fangoria, the uh, director of uh, the, the Diabolical, mm. and he mentioned that his Rite of Passions film was Critters, too, and I said, uh. I don't want to say... Because this is this is like Fangoria speaking, so no judgments on what on what your favorite horror f- film is. But it's like no one has ever said that, and mm-hmm. I actually brought it up at Fantastic Fest with some of my uh, some of my friends there, and they were like they completely agreed. It's like yeah, the Easter Bunny scene. <laughs> I was intense as a kid, so of a certain generation, it's like that scene of yeah. that little Easter Bunny being attacked by Kreitz is something that's imprinted on their head forever. When I watched it, critters. Does not. I'm gonna say the movie again. So get your shot glasses out. Does not implant itself in my brain the way like Ghoulies does. Yeah. Hey, here we go, Ghoulies. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Right you nice. can, you um, drink when we say Ghoulies, yeah. but but Kreitz mean a lot to some people. Right. Yeah. Again, I I I I get the draw, but I don't understand it. But you think it's generational? I think so. It's 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 a generation just after mine. Mine was more. Um, you know, The Exorcist and, and uh, uh, Texas Chainsaw, Last House on the Left. And those are those the films. Those are the ones that I, that I respond to. I mean, I like the Little Rubber Monster films because we've discussed Little Rubber Monsters before. <laughs> but I think of them as like cute little creatures. Yeah. But not something that like an atomic blo- bomb blast like creates this shadow on my brain right. that I could be changed forever. Like Last House on the Left. And I, I saw them at the age when people are watching Critters. Mm-hmm. So I was very, I was like in that 13, 14 year old watching movies, like, which are like that. And they, they were very intense to me at the time. Things like Wild at Heart. Because I remember being in my parents' den, allowed to watch Wild at Heart, Clockwork Orange. Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, seeing 3 with my dad in the theater, but not allowed to see Texas Chainsaw Massacre because they said it was too violent. Yeah. And I've already watched movies that are incredibly unforgettable, and that might be a, a nice way to contextualize it, like A Clockwork Orange. Yeah, well, it, it back in the day, in the early days of the like the mom and pop video store, it, it was, uh, first of all, it was the first time people could get their hands on this stuff. Um, without it having seen it in its one and only run through the, the theaters. But, uh, uh, God, I, you know, you, 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 you're a di- again, you're a different person at the end of Texas Chainsaw or Cannibal Holocaust or In a Glass Cage. It's like you, you, you're really rocked, and you got to kind of walk. Or look at, look at Irreversible. That's a movie that you, you need to see, even though it's not an enjoy, a, a particularly pleasant experience um and it's a film you have to walk off for a couple of days or most people have to that aren't me yes yeah yeah yeah. i thought it was very uh it's it's very interesting to look at uh the narrative techniques strength mm-hmm. of images with uh, minimal dialogue and just the head crushing scene well it's so um and, and i appreciate it the filmmaker's audacity the fact that he he just where most people would go and this happened he, that's where he slows everything down and focuses it in. And the parts we don't want to see is the part that he sort of holds our nose to and, and makes us see. Um, yeah. They're very affecting. We were discuss- Go ahead. Mm-hmm. We were Go discussing ahead. offline, if we're done with uh, Irreversible for a second, uh, uh, Deer Hunter. 
Yeah. As for films that have, it's like, let's just watch a full roulette scene. Well, what's interesting about a film like Deer Hunter or even The Exorcist is, at the time, it being released into the theaters, the reaction was much different than it is now. I remember people like The Exorcist saying people were throwing up and people were passing out and they were having to drag people out of there. And and uh, some of it was this sort of cultural hysteria. But um, then you saw it and it was like, well, this isn't so bad, right? You know, and now it's commonplace. Um, I see pretty shocking scenes of, from The Exorcist on T-shirts. You know? Yes, and now it's considered a classic. Well, yeah. back in the day, it may have been considered more exploitive. Now, I can't speak to how Deer Hunter was received. Mm. How was Deer Hunter received? It was huge. It, it's it was big in the Academy Awards. It was like every it was a a lot of the it was the the beach landing of a lot of our favorite stars: like Meryl Streep, Christopher Walken, Robert uh, Robert De Niro. Um, you know, and it was it was it was honest for want of a better word, you know, it was like, yeah, this war fucks you up, and this is how, and this is, you know, it was genius in the way that it got you to like these guys, and then spin them off into a, into the hell of war, you know. And it, I and, am a but, huge fan of that film. Yeah. But oh, yeah. I don't know if it transfers into a horror movie watch. But I, no, For no, me, it's the more personal descent into horror. Right for me would make more sense as a, as a film. I don't, I never felt transformed by watching Deer Hunter. I knew I was watching great art. Mm. Well, I think the, the roulette scene is so intense that it is trying to recapture that kind of intensity in, in a film like, uh, have you seen 13 Zametti? I have not. It, it, or there was an Americanized version called 13 where it was basically, not Russian roulette, but um, you stood in a circle with a gun, your gun next to the person next to you's head. So it wasn't about you pulling the trigger on yourself. And they watched a light overhead. When the light went off, everyone just pulled their trigger and you either lived or you're not. But that was a horror film, essentially. But using those same things that we learned early on in Deer Hunter... Yeah, they're totally applicable to the... To Did that not come from someone like uh, Tarantino? Because he's a big fan of the Mexican standoff. The idea yeah. is, in Deer Hunter, is a is a man... And I think it's old enough, we don't have to talk about spoilers. Is right. De Niro's character finds Walken as a drugged out, uh, sort of heroin addict over in Nam. Yeah. The whole idea of like going back to the POW, the whole uh, mythology or reality of, of leaving our men behind there finds him while he's making money playing Russian roulette to it's, its inevitable end. Well, I think it's one of those things where Watkins' character had seen so much that and realized that life meant so little that he was willing to, to uh, uh, well, not willing because, you know, the guards were there, but, but I guess we'll use the word willing to, to play the game, you know, in the first place. Uh, and then to excel at it, isn't that weird? To to Because we respond as humans to the things that we do well, right? So what if what you do well is play Russian roulette? It doesn't breed longevity, I guess. And maybe that was the point, that this is a way for him to kill himself. Yes. Without, you know, it's like suicide by cop in a odd, weird... So you saw it as suicide? I guess when I've seen it many times is just that... He was a shell of a person, and this is sort of what a shell of a person does. Well, I think it, is that he didn't live. He didn't live anyway. He was at like a waking death, so it just right. it didn't really matter. Right. Well, I think it was like I'd seen so much that he. I can never go back. I can never go back to the world that I had. To who That's I was very much the film. <clears throat> not, not, not successfully, you know. Yeah. What I mean? So, yeah, but, so in mm-hmm. many ways, I think he was already dead. And but didn't maybe lack the guts to do it himself, even though he was kind of doing it himself inherently in the game. I don't know. I mean, I saw him as as just a tragic figure who who uh, realized that life didn't mean anything, and so why not? You know. But I agree with that. But but uh, to your point, can moments from that be applied to a horror film? Sure. Sure. And I want to say that 13 Zametti was part of the 
eight films to die for the Mm -hmm. after dark thing. It was one of the years they did that. I want to say, um, and it's worth checking out. Yeah, it's worth checking out. Um, uh, but what about a film like, like Mondo Kani? You need to see the Mondo Kani film. I think you need to see, which I just got via, I, I, when I was at my highlight of fantastic fest was to watch a projection of, um, Uncle Uncle Tom, Mondo the Mondo film, mm-hmm. and it's something that will stick with me for the rest of my life because yeah. I played the long version. All those versions are available though out of print on eBay with the blue un- underground uh-huh. Mondo set. It's eight discs, and as soon as I saw it, it's like I have to buy because I have to know why. Wow! And I do own some of the Mondo films. And they're incredibly disturbing, but fascinating because that's what Discovery Channel is now. Yeah, I think what's interesting about, and I'm going to lump all of these together, Mondokani, even Faces of Death, I would, by the way. Face, I was going to say Faces yeah, of Death, that's, Africa. It's not, yeah, because not uh, Adios Africa. That's also on the uh, the set because I always felt, and there's a great Gorezone article written by uh, Pierre uh, John Trani that goes into the. Faces of Death movies or the real death food movies. And when I was talking to him about the article, I, I always felt like they were kind of part of the Mondo cycle, mm-hmm. though not never spoken about as part of the Mondo cycle. Yeah, and these are all. At the same time. I, I don't think you need to be a completist on these things because once you see one or two, you kind of get the idea. Yeah, you want to see um, Adios Africa, Barrel Uncle Tom. You want to see Mondo Kane, you want to see the first Faces of Death, and one of the Traces of Death would probably make sense. Mm-hmm. Because, uh, yeah. I actually grew up watching uh, Traces of Death, and I was uh, very transformed by that because that was pre-YouTube, so I'm watching actual autopsies. Right. And that was very chilling to see because w- the culture at that point wasn't super saturated with the availability yeah, of you death. This was before things like Lively it, and, you know, and that was all, at, all yep. around and available. Um, Not that we but I, those sites. But I think those are, those are films you, you kind of need to see a couple of them. And once you have, you get the idea that, you know, when the body, the human body dies, it's a messy thing. And, um, and you move on, right? And, and as, I think as you age and as you become more refined as a, a viewer... It's like okay, I need a little context from this. It's like it's like a loop versus a full porn film. You know what I mean? A little context helps. Yes. Uh, I'm marking stuff off. So here. I think uh, I think by looking at something like Mondo, the the Mondo cycle and the Faces of Death cycle, you sort of learn about the presentation. It's almost all those movies are a lot like sideshow presentation. Mm-hmm. They show something lurid and horrible and unspeakable, and they go too far, and it's inex- inexplicable, but it's always wrapped up in sort of a narrative and, and fun music, or yeah. presented like anthologies. Yeah, it's almost, it's very nudgy to the its audience, those films. Mm-hmm. It's very like, hey, look at this, we're going to so- show you some shit here, and, and they usually pay off. Yeah. Yes, it usually, it usually speaks to the, uh, the douche. I, what is funny is that a set that I'm, uh, I'm I'm working on, we're talking to the two special effects artists, or we're, we're trying to find the other one who actually were the special effects artist on Faces of Death. So if you did not already think that most of that footage is fake... There you go. <laughs> the wow. special effects artists from Faces of Death are out there, and I think that's hysterical. Yeah, that is... It's another yeah. layer. Another Let's layer talk about, of not real. Talk about huge. That was one of those tapes that... You know, you always, it, it got brought out as a party was waning. You know, anyone want to see the Faces of Death stuff? And people would play it, and it was this whole thing. You know, big VHSs and oh yeah, stuff. But I, but again, I think, I think it's and, important. And took on the idea because a lot of the big box VHSs, and we may get mail to correct me if I'm wrong. It's like I think a lot of them wanted to stand out a bit like the porn tapes. Yeah, so they the were huge. Always in a big box. They were huge clamshells. What they used to call them that that were uh, uh, on the shelf. Yeah, you definitely knew what was going on there, um, uh, and they didn't bury the lead when it came to the box art either. Mm-hmm. You know, 
A lot of, it, oddly, I remember a lot of them would steal the image of the impaled girl from Cannibal Holocaust. They would spread that across the, the front, even though it had nothing to do with what was inside of it. Um, but then that was also in the whole, remember the, uh, yes. the bootleg market of someone would, would make a say... copy, copy of a copy? Uh-huh. Yeah, those were the days. You kids today should revel in the fact that you can just dial all this shit up on online. Um, so, uh, what are, do you think that a film like, say, um, one of the, on my list, I added Fury Road and, and Fury Road, I think is important, a modern rite of passage film because it's, it's, it's Fury Road and it's so over the top that, that it sort of makes you, you, and so different from the films being made now that you, even though it has no story. I would almost say a rite of passage film needs to be around for a bit to build you? up a, 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 not a legend, but almost a legend and a mystique. And I, and I think that years from now, this film is still going to be affecting, but currently an amazing film, I would not consider it a rite of of passage because it is not the stuff of legend. Again, legend that is either refers to a great film like Deer Hunter or just poor quality films that you need to see mm. like the like the faces like Faces of Death. So maybe that Fury Road is a film because we're maker. talking about legends. It's like when you meet somebody. I think it's too new. Yeah, I think it's a filmmaker's rite of passage, but maybe not. I think all filmmakers need to see it. Yeah, but I don't necessarily think it's a rite of passage. Okay. People say it's like you haven't seen it. Oh my god, you need to see it. It's so great, but it doesn't have the mystique. And because the idea is like that, these films have been around for a bit, mm. and that the fan has not made the effort to watch it mm. is stunning. That's what I mean. Like its shelf life has to be there because if like you're in 2015 and you haven't seen Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The reason that, you know, we, we raise an eyebrow is that it's been around since 1974. One of the, and maybe, maybe you should have watched it. One of the things we said, I said to you off mic, was like, like if someone says to you, I've never seen The Exorcist, you kind of, you, you have to adjust your thinking. You know what I mean? There are certain you films. You do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where you, where you think, uh, and there are certain things that, you know, that I haven't seen that, you know, that some things just slip through the cracks, but somehow if you, there, there's those that if you say you didn't see night, the original Nightmare on Elm Street, most of, most horror fans kind of cock, cock an eyebrow. It's, that's a perfect. It took me a long time to watch the uncut, correctly matted Halloween. Oh, really? I never saw it. Because a lot of those films, because when I was young, I never thought to rent Halloween or Friday the 13th or all those films. Mm-hmm. I've seen them on cable and I've seen them like on USA and, and Channel 11. But to actually sit and watch those films, a few of them I saw in the theater, but I have not sat down and watched all those Rite of Passage films without commercials, not on HBO, right. correctly matted. So I would say I haven't watched a lot of those slasher films the, the way that they are presented. Mm. For me, I think they're important rite of passage. My my issue is, is that I'm not super interested to run and watch them based on my thesis of what I'm working on right. as, a, as a filmmaker and artist. There's no need, right? No, but they are important. If someone Agreed. said it's like Friday the 13th, it's like whether, because it's like, it's like whether I think so or not, it's like you should watch them. You should sure. watch them and read about them. There's a great book, Blood Money, about the marketing behind a lot of the slasher films. But out of that, that, that bunch of slasher films, I have seen Black Christmas. And for me, so I projected, that is a scary movie and holds up being scary because it's all uh-huh. atmosphere. Yeah. You never trust a house with 1970s Christmas lights. Am I right? Right. No good can come from that house. I, uh, I, I saw in the theater uh, Black Christmas and on, on its original release, Phantasm, as a double bill. Ooh. And it was great. Phantasm is something to Yeah, that's watch. another one. I think the first one. After that, you can, you, know, you can pick and choose as you like. You know? I don't think the rest, 2, 3, 4, or 5, or 11, is our critical viewing. While I think the first Phantasm is absolutely 
important. Yes, it is. And w- watching it is... I mean, I still find it disturbing. I saw it projected when I was in Austin at some point, and it was for Texas Frightmare. Mm. Coscarelli was there, and, mm. uh, and a, lot, a, lot of the, a lot of the cast. And they, they were, showed a print, and they were doing a live commentary for it for a print which oddly enough he goes like oh this isn't a great print and it was his print it was, it was in gorgeous condition and so and it's just so disjointed and surrealistic so when i tell people it's like i like you need to watch phantasm which means you need to watch suspiria which it's sort of inspired by and then if you want to talk to like cult waters films mm. But it's not necessarily a need to see because a need to see in John Waters' land is Pink Flamingos. Sure. I feel, though, the B side of that is Desperate Living. Because really? Desperate Living, uh, Suspiria, and Phantasm have a strange structure to it. And part of its uneasy structure is what's so damn unnerving about it because it follows no logic. But has but has has content and narrative. It's just it's just atypical storyline movement. Hmm. Yeah. One one of the things you you were talking about Halloween. I'm only I'm not a big Halloween fan. I'm not a big slasher movie fan because I had already been through a cycle of giallo, and yes. and American slasher films sort of come from that. And but they, I don't think they do it as well. Um. I was just discussing this online. Well, Jalo is, is, yes, it goes into what we're talking about, these strange narratives, is that when I've I've, uh, interviewed some of the guys who work work with uh, Fulci, most of the folks from Beyond, I asked, is like, does does Italy bring forth this great violent surreal cinema? And they said, no. It's like they're seeing what the Americans did, and they go, well, we can create something, which is a true exploitation model, of creating something more gory, intense, more sex, Mm-hmm. And that's like a gap analysis. It's like, and this is where we can we can we can put our stuff. Which is why those films are are are, are like that way. And when I've spoken to Argento, we talked about a lot of automatic writing yeah. to produce his work. I know Ken Please. Russell also used automatic writing to sort of create these wild images. And I think a lot of the Italian cinema, you know, save like Ken Russell from the uh, from the UK, is that the the giallo cinema is all about one strange, intense imagery after the other, right. sort of created by this cacophonous noise of their synth <laughs> music that they worked for, and an incredible amount of gels. And from that seed is Barrio Bava. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, Bava sort of was the cornerstone of that. His black, uh, Blood and Black Lace was, what, 62, 63? Mm-hmm. So, so uh, Giallo's Proper were through late 60s, early 70s, and slashers began in the late 70s. But before that was the German Krimi film, which is inherently the same kind of thing. Uh, Krimi films are in, from Germany. They're, they're like a cross between a giallo and a drawing room mystery, like an Agatha Christie thing. Um, but they were very stilted and very stiff. And while, when that formula drifted into Italy and became the giallo, of course, they're Italian, so you get... A lots of sex and a lot of mom issues <laughs> and a lot of all that stuff. They added their flair to it. Um, and then, again, by the late 70s, early 80s, the slasher film was here in America. Um, and we tried, we, we did our own thing to it, usually um, puritanically saying, if you had sex, you die. If you lie to your parents, you die. If you do drugs, you die. You know what I mean? It seemed very focused on uh, sin... Yeah, is, Abs- Germ- is Germany a very Catholic state or Christian state? No, no, Germany. Remember, they have they they're well. <laughs> I don't want to speak in like generalities like that, but Germany is the place where shisa porn comes from. So <laughs> I don't know. It does, it does. But, it's, but the whole, because because when you talk about Jolio cinema, of course, there's a great. Uh, there might be the idea of a great Catholic influence on that oh, on that work, perhaps. Yeah. Or it's been, or again, the other side of the coin is that it's just figured as a full marketing campaign, and yeah. that's what I always assumed is that the culture is is so much about uh, uh, sanctity, but it's also about the cannibalism of a messiah, perfect storm 
to create these super gore-esque old movies. It's not intentional. It certainly could be read that way. Yeah, I, I think that it's all sex and violence and, and the black glove killer as the id and the knife is the penis and, you know, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, what about something like The Godfather? I mean, again, that's not really a horror film, but it's... Never mind. I withdraw the, I withdraw the Godfather the more I think about it. Um, see, for me, like... Uh, if people want the idea of operatic stage telling and the Baroque, which I think horror is desperately missing because horror is always agreed. taking place in someone's house, The Godfather would be something to watch. Because that's, as, as I, what am I attracted to? I am attac- attracted to very theori- theoretical play within the genre, which is also akin to, and it makes 100%, uh, and it makes 100% clear Jolio films are about stage, theatrical, a lot of times over the top grand guignol images. Mm-hmm. I would say the 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 A list version of that is definitely the Godfather one too. Yeah, I think uh, um, operatic, absolutely. But I, I'm trying. I just don't. I mean, because for me personally, that changed everything. Uh, that was one of those films that changed everything because I didn't, I never realized that you could apply such grand themes to something like a gangster film, um, and I was young when it came out, so um, yeah, I'm just curious because there's a couple of other things on my list that don't necessarily click in for the genre fan, though. Although there is horror in them, I mean, Apocalypse Now, First Blood. I think Apocalypse Now is super important for any genre fan uh, to watch. Because think about its genre elements. It has a very strong, shady villain in back. It's 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 a, it's that emotional, stylistic uh, tenor, and it's filled with atmosphere, edgy, nightmarish atmosphere. It's mm-hmm. not a straight Vietnam film. Right. It's right. it's sort of like the night the nightmare of Vietnam. The literal nightmare of Vietnam, because Vietnam was was a nightmare. Right, right, right. But this and, is taking those metaphors of probably what, and and I'm too young to know, but what's what was probably going on in society during that time, and just just pitching it up to the highest tenor, and that's what genre does. Mm. Same I'm with trying, Taxi Driver. Taxi Driver is in that in that sort of Vietnam type world, nightmare absolute, world. Absolutely, First Blood, same thing. Taxi Driver is a, a film that I think every genre fan should see. Um, I th- well, yeah, I was going to say something else about that, but but no. Um, but again, it's it's one of those that, if not thematically horror, there are definitely moments of horror that you can easily find um, in that film. Mm-hmm. Uh, say again. I agree. Um, and uh, going down my list here, uh, we've talked about Serbian film in the past, but I think a Serbian film is, is one of those that, you know, gets brought up when the idea of extreme cinema gets brought up. Um, people always, that's their go-to these days. It used to be something else like Texas Chainsaw or what have you, but it used to be Martyrs, I think. Martyrs was, yeah, Martyrs was before that or Audition. Yeah. Make use Audition. So, um, do we want to rehash or even go talk about a Serbian film other than, yeah. We could talk about it for a second. I mean, it's one of those films that entered the lexicon of legend much stronger than Audition or Martyrs, I think, because the unrated version Mm. was not so easy to come by. So it became a thing of legend and hearsay and people couldn't get a hold of it. It had a problem legally even showing it. It was sketchy in some areas. And so all that talk around that film added to the legend of the film, but also the Serbian film for what it is delivers. Sure. So it wasn't like, your, it wasn't like the sort of mystique around Human Centipede, and then they feel the film didn't deliver, though I like Human Centipede because I've always watched it as a horror comedy mm-hmm. and not something as the most debased thing on earth. Right. But Serbian film, you know, it go it goes for it. 
But you almost get that legend going ahead of time. You get it with the uh, with Serbian film. You got it with uh, House of a Thousand Corpses. By the time we got to see House of a Thousand Corpses, people were more than ready. Um, and now with uh, Green Inferno, you know, first couple of days, oh. people were just saying how wonderful that was. And, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've spoken a lot about Green Inferno. And for folks who are listening at home, it just doesn't it doesn't deliver on the spectacular imagery, mm. which which it's its kind has come from. Many, many years ago, because when we brought up Cannibal Holocaust, it's like, Cannibal Holocaust is, like, is unforgivable, and we're not asking people to mutilate turtles to make their cannibal films. Just know that if you're making a cannibal, cannibal film, just if you, like you're making an, uh, a nice fluctuation film, those films are the two most notorious takes, which is why a lot of the current exploitation films are more of a comedy. Because you don't want to make something like Ilsa. Those films are depressing and incredibly difficult to watch. Right. Agreed. Or Love Camp 9. Nobody wants to watch that. I don't even think you, there's a place to release those films. Other so, than they, so they take a more comedic approach yeah. Yeah. to it. Yeah. And maybe and Cannibal Holocaust is a, is, is a hybridization of bro humor and the attempt to be edgy. And it's like either you're going to match your people or you're not going to a great example of that is last house on the left the original film and the remake i don't mind the remake because the remakes decided i can't fight the most notorious film ever made right so let's i'm going to i'm going to focus on something different yeah agreed agreed what was uh what was your first third world cannibal film do you remember was it cannibal holocaust because that came i i read about chaz ballon used to write about cannibal holocaust almost exclusively saying that it was a film that quote delivered the groceries. Um, but, uh, by the time I got my hands on it, there was no way it could ever live up to everything I'd heard. Um, and in the end, yeah. Yes. I, that was the first cannibal film that I saw. A lot of my stuff that I watched, I watched while, reading Gore Zone and Fangoria magazine and whatever they said or whatever I could research. Also, Phantom of the Movie Guide. Mm -hmm. Uh, What is... Hardy's book on horror. A lot of stuff's in there. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, Splatter Movie Guides, Modern Horror Film, Cold Movies 1 through 3. Yeah, for me it was the Deep Red stuff. Psychotronic. See, I couldn't get a hold of that. I could get a Uh. hold of that. I have... One of, the, like, the last issues that has, like, Cat and the Brain on it, because we were talking yeah. about Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. But I couldn't get a hold of them unless I, I mail-ordered. And a lot of that stuff wasn't top of mind at the time to, to mail-order. I have no idea why. There used to be a guy, Tom Weiser, who ran a company called Video Search of Miami that used to put out review books. Um, I've got a couple of them up on my shelf, mostly on Japanese cinema and Japanese horror, but... Um, those are really influential too for me, to, just to find stuff. Um, also, uh, the psychotronic guide, mm-hmm. very important. So all those things, because I'm trying to think what led me to Cannibal Holocaust, because it certainly wasn't the VHS cover, but I can't recall how Cannibal Holocaust found me or the Mondo Kane films, other than reading and going these, and almost knowing. This is an interesting thing, knowing that these were touchpoint films. Mm-hmm. Because when you read about Cannibal Holocaust, it's like, I need to... And you just become obsessed with the idea of seeing it, even if you can't find it. Well, that was part of it. Same with Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's like, I need... I needed to see Texas Chainsaw Massacre when I was young more than anything else in in my life. And and it's hard currently to find these touchstone films of films that you're, like, fucking obsessed with. That you're obsessed with seeing before you ever see it. It's like, I need that that rush. I need to find it. So often these days, you can get anything via iTunes or VOD or or what have you. You know what I mean? It's not. It's it's uh, accessibility is so much greater. I can remember hearing of things like like in a glass cage. I had heard about that for years and years, and the only way I finally saw it was to go to one of these tape traders, and I ended up getting a copy, and uh, that lived up to everything I had heard. Yes. That's a great film. No one ever talks about it except you and me. 
<laughs> yes. No, it's a, it's a great film. And again, like, it's, it's like, what, were these films in the zeitgeist when I found it? Like, when I tell people they need to watch Solo. Yeah. Was it in, was it in the zeitgeist? People should watch Scanners. If people are not watching well, Scanners, I wonder where you've been to watch the... For me, it's the incredible head sequence that everyone loves, the exploding head, but the in that film is Michael Ironside's monologue. Oh, yeah, About absolutely. trying to drill... And that's yeah. just, just the way it's staged, his delivery, what it means to cast an actor in that part that could say those lines is, right. br- is brilliant. Yeah, and yeah. I think Scanners is an important film to see. Dawn of the Dead, out of like all the sure. zombie movies ever made, and not my favorite zombie movie ever made, but if someone said, like, what is the most important zombie film, I think it's Dawn of the Dead. Far uh, more than Night of the Living Dead. Uh, Speak to that zombie messiah. <laughs> No, I, I think if you're going to watch one, it's got to be Night, just because it's it's there's no it doesn't get cute with it, and it doesn't um, and it's it's out to scare you, it's out to genuinely scare you. Where I think Dawn, again, they always I always talk about this, but they lose me at the pie fight. It just becomes so silly that you you uh, it's sort of antithetical to what we're here to do, and that's to be scared, right? Um, but again, man. Dawn was something everybody had to see when it came out. You know what I mean? So maybe- I also think it's the first true civilization of zombies because they were ghouls or flesh eaters in Night of the Living Dead, as most genre fans would know. But in Dawn, he embraced the idea that, yes, these are zombies, and that is your first true zombie films. And I've discussed before, it's the idea that it uh, predicted Reaganomics, right. the different styles of zombies that, it, that existed that were both uh, weird blue gray color but then you had some that were much more ornate that were then evolved into into day day being my favorite agreed not the most uh day has some of the best zombies ever i although i think that uh savini's remake we've talked about this before but the optic nerve stuff in the the night remake is we could talk about john volch's zombies every episode and ghoulies just just a shot (laughs) (laughs) uh but yeah just awesome. But, yeah, I agree. For me, Dawn, it, it got silly, and I was always pulled back by the, the look of the zombies, the whole blue face and um, and how red the blood was. It was more like paint than... than Accessory and blood from back in the day. Right. Well, yes, it's, it's a film that, in some instances, does not fulfill its thesis. I would say the same about some shots in Last House on the Left, yes. especially with yeah. these the silly cops. Mm-hmm. But I think as as genre fans, I could look over it. So I re- I so I recommend Dawn as the gateway drug to zombies because those are true true to life zombies, the first OG zombies of what became zombie films. Now, because we yeah. have two types of movies, and I would also say I would not I I would suggest something like Twenty Eight Days Later, mm-hmm. which is the evolution of what then was, which which actually started with the seed of what was Crazies. So Crazies begot the infected, yes. and that's its own offshoot of zombie cinema. But right. I th- but I think they they became clear of what they were, and probably like something like Twenty Eight Days Later. But no one ever brought up it's like those were crazy. I just think they weren't packaged in such a way or done so stylistically to be as memorable as the children of the crazies that came out. Yeah, absolutely. I think that you gotta if you're if, since we're talking zombie films, you know you gotta throw in. Fulci Zombie, you got to throw in. Uh, you need to see Fulci Zombie because that the is Living that, Dead. Because seeing Fulci Zombie, the effects in it are so brutal, and that's the idea of like taking inspiration from Romero's film and then amping up that gore, oh, and that it becomes legendary for the gore that you've seen. And if you haven't in your life, I think I think the two most notorious and gateway impalings would be the one. In Cannibal Holocaust, yes, and the one in Zombie, yeah, the one in see. Zombie is so it's it's really not nice. I mean, it's it, not. It, it, it's it's obvious that at the time Fulci really wanted to make his audience squirm. I mean, uh, it's not since like Andalusian Dog, right? When we saw the ice slit, that's fuck with people's eyes and they get really weird. And man, he did it in space. But odd that I've seen pieces of that scene 
on TV in commercials, like for t- at advertising TV. They they did one with the with the zombie versus the shark. That was amazing. I read about that for Dread Central, and someone was asking me why am I covering TV commercials, and it's just it's paramount because that's when counter this this kind of like horror culture, real horror culture, which would be which would be um which would be that sequence penetrates the market. But a lot of people yeah. say the reason you see that is because who's running pop culture now? Yeah, is, and, it's, and it's interesting, speaking of zombies, that up until Return of the Living Dead, Brains wasn't in a lexicon. That's right. That's something Dan O'Bannon gave us. Yeah, but now you can't think of zombies without someone saying... I mean, you go to a Halloween party, the first thing a zombie's going to say to you is Brains. It's true, and that they speak at all. And yeah. how that has crossed over into the Romero universe, even though it never used in the Romero universe. Right. So it's like, it's a splice between Romero zombies who walked a certain way and the zombies that said brains. And you know what? I would say most people have seen the Romero cycle. I would say most civilians have not seen Return of the Living Dead. And I would put that down as a, as a movie they should see. Absolutely. Because- I'd, I'd put it down because it's a horror comedy that actually works on both levels. It does. It's genuinely scary, and it's genuinely funny. And a lot of the humor comes from the absurdity of the type of characters that they've put in a very dangerous situation. Right. And I think also the absurdity that often gets lost um, in that, of that dangerous situation. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, I always love scenes, like in zombie cinema, where, like, two people, um, uh, the Snyder's... Uh, uh, Don remake at the back door between um, uh, the, the 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 main actor and the black guy uh, when they're discussing opening the back door comedy that's inherent in the moment that's still tense and still frightful but is also genuinely and organically funny. Yes, and I and I think again it it speaks to the uh, comedy idea of absurdity or the existentialist idea around absurdity. And yeah. that's a it's a great thing to learn from the, from the from the film. What are your thoughts on Shaun of the Dead? Have we discussed that? I almost feel the zen that you are not a fan. Um no, no. I I I think uh I love Shaun of the Dead. I mm. think it it works on again as a comedy. It's genuinely scary, it's genuinely gory. It genuinely tugs at the heartstrings. Um I am a uh, I am less of a fan of the rest of the trilogy. The uh, uh, I forget what they call it. Um, yes. But Hot Fuzz and uh, End of the World or whatever yes. it's called. Rest of Bar at the End of the World or whatever the fuck it was called. Uh, I'm less of a fan of that, of those. Um, because I think Shaun of the Dead, the script, has so many inside little winks to know, knowing zombie audiences that you can tell. There's a there's, there's an earnestness there that um, they really wanted to make a scary film, I think, but also make a funny film. Also, situation doesn't necessarily lead to comedy there. It's writing full fleshed characters and the casting of those characters, which really makes them alive and kind of silly in that situation. Right, and and they and when they have those. I call them the hand on hip moment where someone goes, let me tell you about what happened to me before all this went down. Um, uh, they keep it to a minimum and they, they, they give you little bits that accumulate over time. So by the time they make it to the Winchester, you know who everyone is, that you know the dynamic, you know how, you know, who you want to die, <laughs> <laughs> who you don't want to die, and how bold was that in one of the people that they killed. I didn't want the dad to die, though I thought his death is absolutely hysterical. Yeah. That he hated that fucking music and turned it off. <laughs> right, right. Even in death, he can't stand these kids' music with their long hair, yeah. all the noises. <laughs> but I think those guys, you know, they know they know their genre. You know, I think they really, they really nailed it. Um, and I, I think the horror comedy and the idea of absurd leads is, of course, solidify, I think, so wholly... In Evil Dead 2. Yeah. Well, see, I, Evil Dead 2 was hard for me because I had seen Evil Dead 1. Talk about a film that I, it was one of those, uh, when it was released to VHS, that was how I saw it. And I really liked the first one. And when I heard that they were doing a second one, I was ready for more. 
And what I got was A, more of the same, because it was essentially the same script, and B, I got laughs, and n- neither of which I wanted. So I really hated that film for a long time. I've since changed my mind. Do you uh, think it's important to watch? Uh, I, I would say number two is much more important than one, but number one might be a little bit more important to focus on what true independent guerrilla filmmaking looks like because you have Evil Dead and always Texas Chainsaw Massacre are compared because it was Chainsaw first and then Mm -hmm. Evil Dead kind of took to Relentless and made that film. Both of them are funny in the blackest kind of way, which is interesting because their sequels follow the the, the same tracks of taking all the black comedy of the first one and Relentlessness and 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 amping up the relentlessness, but then amping up the comedy even more, the black comedy. Right. I think it was it was apart also, from it, each other because I don't think that they looked at each other and go like our sequels are going to be comedy horrors, and yet. <laughs> but I but they I are. think that they both of those guys have. I mean, they 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 always, and I think they've said this that they always wanted to make a Three Stooges film, and that's kind of the way I see Evil Dead Two as a horror Three Stooges film. Because it's yeah. so over the top and so ridiculous. Uh, 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 Army of Darkness just seemed weird to me. Like it, it, it felt very corporate, um, but still memorable and fun. I'm very excited about the TV show. I was so against the TV show when I first heard about it, but I was every- skeptical. I wasn't against it. I was skeptical because I went like, only Army of Darkness would make sense. Mm-hmm as something that could be a series and then I was just blown away by yeah. what you came up with. The, the, I've not seen a single bit of either footage or their advertising that hasn't made me more excited about it. Yes. Um, so they, they, they seem to be letting them go, letting them do whatever, you know? Um, and I like that they're, they're portraying him as older. Um, yes. Uh, I like, I think we we sh- there more of that. I like the at least one of the fearless vampire killers being an older person um, is good. It's good for us as a society, and I think it's good for the genre. Yes, my favorite old uh, vampire slayer will always be Sam Fuller and Return to Salem's Lot. Yeah, that is a, that is a very brilliant casting decision of the Nazi hunter going after zombies. Yeah. Oh, yeah, or or like Bubba, Bubba Hotep is another one. Yes. That yes. kind of works in that weird, silly way. Um, sidebar on that, I just saw some footage or or some an image from um, Sundance's Happen Leonard series that's coming out, and it looks mm-hmm. really good. They've changed a bit of the mythos, but it looks really good. Um, so you've seen uh, Green Inferno. I have seen Green Inferno. Um. I, I, uh, yeah, I haven't. I I, 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 saw it at Fantastic Fest like two years ago, two and a half years ago. Right, because it's been it's been bouncing around. It has been. It needed to find its home. Yeah. Um. Uh. Yeah. We we'll we'll save. I was about to open the Eli Roth file, but I'm not going to. I can't think of any of his films that are a gateway film, but I will say probably hard. Just like there's films that I'm not a huge fan of, but I think people should watch anyway to get it. Sure. I think people need to watch in, in that, in, in that instance, people should watch the saw films. Yes. They watch the first one. I sort of gave up after number one. I've always was curious about number three because of its social political stance. And folks need to watch Hostel. And generally Absolutely. Hostel 2 yeah. is the strongest film because they were the beginning of a certain cycle of filmmaking in America that also Rob Zombie was a part of. Mm-hmm. But I actually can't think of any Rob Zombie films that would consider to be a gateway drug because I think there's stronger examples of that sort of torture porn cinema sure. that was saw hostile. Even with the, even if there are better examples of and, like and high tension. Of Those like would hill, be of like hillbilly horror. There's better yeah, examples I of love that. Hillbilly horror. Yeah, there's not a lot of it, but Chainsaw is hillbilly horror. Yes, definitely. Um, but a southern hillbilly horror, which is what Rob Zombie's going for, right? Because you have southwestern kind of hillbillies and Hills Have Eyes, right? I don't really necessarily think Hills Have Eyes 
is a gateway to no. our... That's kind of like what people down again, the line. It has a certain audacity because it kill like it kills people that you think you thought were untouchable. Um, so you know it's maybe a little for that. It is. It inspires me. The hills have eyes. It inspires my gear. Definitely. Sure. Um, uh, going everybody, back. To- everybody on Earth needs to watch Alien and Alien. Sure. I mean, oh, those are some of those films I was talking about. It's like, even even the horror aspects in some of the Harry Potter films can be. Uh, the first Harry Potter film I think is need to be, but I think it's it's because as it get darker and as it got more like gothy and shit, it's like for me it was always the first one because it felt it felt so new mm-hmm. and whimsical. So to draw the idea of just a whimsical magical film where you don't really need huge levels of darkness which it seems to be in all films that you can't sell anything unless it's gritty right it's very interesting to see something like that because it reminds us of our disney episode that we did a lot of those films had that whimsical nice quality to it like things like like pollyanna there there wasn't so much of a deep dive into the blackness of the human soul and and when they expect our 11 year olds to watch and when they did the results were things like bed knobs and broomsticks it wasn't you know, killing off a character that everyone liked, which which they did in what the fourth Harry Potter, they yes. killed off uh, what's his name, the guy that went on to Twilight. Um, you mentioned needs to be gritty. You mentioned audition. Yes. Uh, I think there's there's lots of films out there with the la- of the last name Miyake that are are that fall oh, into this category. The film the film that that they should watch, and actually I need to. Get together in my interview with uh, with 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 Mike San. He mentioned that Americans know him for his horror, but as we know, he's made like hundreds of films mm-hmm. in all different genres. <laughs> but for the horror fan, and I've seen this stuff that's out of genre, like um, Great Yokai War. It's Ichi the Killer. People should watch. Sure, that yeah. Over audition. Sure, I think for disturbed disturbedness. Visitor Q gets a little squidgy. Well, those are my, that's my favorite is yeah. Visitor, Visitor Q because uh, it's just insane and disturbing. I don't know if it's the great example I, of insane and disturbing, <laughs> but Ichi the Killer certainly talks about what it looks like to make contemporary gore set pieces. I'll tell you the double bill, Visitor Q and Gasper Knows I Stand Alone. That would be good. That with, would break with a, a little, lot of hearts. With a little old boy as a nice topper. Old boy is someone every, everybody needs to watch. Old boy, and I would sure. think everybody needs to watch Sympathy of Lady Vengeance. Yes. You want Lady to talk Vengeance about our, our case cinema. Is the shit. It's uh, so amazing. It is amazing because it's incredibly violent. It's very bloody. And it, magi- and it, and it, it remains beautiful. And I'll use the word again whimsical and imaginative that the decision out of nowhere to use animation to tell such a gore written revenge story. Yeah. It's like taking those unexpected moments and late lady vengeance to our readers, uh, to our readers at home. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a real, it's a really, it's a really different. It's got a kind great, of film to watch. a great wind up and, and there's got, some really terrific moments in there. You know, um, before we leave Miyake, uh, you're right. Everyone does know him for his horror stuff, but if you watch some of the Yaku- Yakuza films he did, um, uh, Black Shinjuku Triad Society or some something or other. I've just uh, watched Yakuza Apocalypse, and that movie. Is have amazing. you really? I just I saw did. the trailer for that, and that looks really. I did. I, here's the thing about it delivers. It delivers because it's like one of those films we're mentioning. Desperate Living and Phantasm and Suspiria that at some point these there are directors out there that are creating image after image of sort of a tone poem. Yeah. yeah. And 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 that would be the guys to go to because there's there's people that just put disorienting content on screen and you go, I can't understand, I can't engage, but somehow these directors and their gonzo style are able to pull it together. And I've never sat and tried to analyze why they put them together. I think it's just strong characterizations, casting of a strong actor that's going to be an anchor throughout the story, 
that that is sort of in our space as a spectator, whether it be um, br- whether it be uh, Bruce Campbell or your 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 main Yakuza guys and Yakuza Apocalypse, and then having absolutely fascinating things around them and never stopping. It's kind of like the crank version <laughs> that they're putting in these movies, and it's like I can't. I understand the crank films are very influential. I don't have the the the, the patience of a gnat. To watch them. No, they're because they're, it's like I can't pay attention to an image that is only on screen for five minutes. All, all of those, I'll get a migraine. All of the <laughs> films by those guys are a little tough to take. Um, the, they have their they have their they have their audience, and I think they, sure. they influence cinema. Yeah, a lot. sure. But for well, me, my Gonzo filmmaking of, of English actors will always belong to Guy Ritchie. Yeah, and we can learn from those movies, which I don't really see a lot in horror films. The idea of lyrical, stylized dialogue. Well, I think that any time you show uh, lyrical violence, you yeah. can you can apply it into horror. Um, before we leave Miyake out, I would say that the thing that has always and I, I may have said this on the podcast before, but the thing that has always interested me about him. Um, the entry point was all the genre stuff, and I thought, okay, he does this this sort of thing very, very well, and that's all fine and dandy. But for me, the epiphany happened as I started to broaden out. And by the time you get through the Yakuza films, and by the time you get to something like Bird People of China, which is a beautiful film, um, you realize that this is this is a true filmmaker, not because he makes films well, but because he has the talent to literally do anything. And he discusses that. He dis- and I don't want to give away too much of the uh, of the interview to our twenty listeners. But <laughs> he he says it's it's like because I asked him it's like what would be your inspiration or inspirational words for filmmakers? And he says don't think that you're a certain sort of filmmaker and the material is below you. Excellent. You do what comes your way and you explore those different sort of things. He thinks like maybe because he's Japanese or Japanese filmmakers are quote-unquote, I think he uses the word greedy, but he wants to make all different types of films to see how it is to make all different types of films. Sure. For, I mean, the guy, if you look at uh, the guy who made Audition, and then you look at, the, like, The Great Yokai War or Yatterman. Look, look, look at Yatterman. Yatterman is like a straight-up uh, Pokemon commercial. Uh <laughs> It's it's bizarre, but it's great. Zebra Man's the same way. It, they're, 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 the, of the Korakawas, if I'm saying that correctly, um, that's great. That's a musical. With, the Kuris, yeah, that that's like a musical zombie film, which with is claymation, awesome. and, yeah, not, like, awesome. and not like your slick claymation. Right. It's but like un- Baby Snakes <laughs> era, like Frank Zappa <laughs> Baby Snakes era. Um, it is. Before we, before we leave Japan, I also want to throw out a film, which for me was kind of transgressive and sort of eye-opening, and that is uh, the work of Shinya Tsukamoto, which I know uh, you're a fan of as well. But w- w- the first time I saw Iron Man, I knew that I wasn't going to be the same when that was... Uh, or Tetsuo, the Iron Man. I knew that I wasn't going to be the same, the same person, or my reality that, wasn't going to be the same. That is a film that's not brought up enough, and I was honored enough to write about uh, Tetsuo for your uh, magazine because it's appropriate within that counterculture mm-hmm. '90s, early '80s ideal of what was going on, where thinking people used the, the tropes of, of experimental cinema to create these immersive experiences. And I would love to, with the technology that we have today, see a lot of folks go back to that time era, look at that stuff, look at Begotten and, and things like that, and, and just make something incredibly strange. Especially because now you're not worried about using film anymore. Right. You can do what you want. And a lot of that stuff is also because we're always worried about being very hyper-realistic. Mm-hmm. These films are not very realistic. These films are, are my favorite thing, which is much more theatrical. And yeah. the idea of artifice should be explored in, in films with your visuals, your art direction, your set design. They also sort of paste over a little bit if, you're not, if you don't have these high budgets. Like in the noirs that we all watch, the reason you saw those black backgrounds was not became like a, sty- a stylistic trope. Right. But they used them because they couldn't afford sets. And it's easier to hide them in shadow, sure. Yes, yes. Yeah, and in those tricks, and you never think that you're watching a Kiss of Death and it does, isn't worth a, a thousand bucks by yeah. using those techniques. Yeah. And they're being, they're being imaginative, but instead of these people kind of hiding behind budgets, they created 
avant-garde, crazy, crazy films because that's what they wanted it to look like. Have, and I think that that's an interesting headspace for a creative person to be in. Have you seen the trailer for this Edgar Allan Poe thing? I am not. It's uh, it's it's really wild. It's it's animated, sort of stop motiony, sort of computer motiony kind of thing. Um, but I I'm finding more and more, especially since knowing Langley and he keeps showing me these things. Um, short animated films are willing to go into that same space that Tetsuo the Iron Man is that that where it's engaging but confounding to the viewer and you're following it and anything's possible because it's not real and um, so I'm finding a lot of that stuff like that uh, uh, in in short uh, genre film uh, another name I want to throw out there is before we leave Asia is Cyan Sono yes talk about not being the same when you're done. You know, uh, when I first saw Strange Circus, I I can't tell you how many emotions <laughs> I went through watching that. Do I, am I mad? Am I not mad? Do I shut it off? Do I not shut it off? What do I, you know? Um, but he's a guy that doesn't mind, uh, uh, doesn't always have your best interest at heart, you being the viewer. Well, I think that's an important lesson to learn from a few of the films that we brought up. Is that are you make it who is the audience of your film and are and and are you there to terrorize them? And what is the level and kind of terrorization that you wanna give your audience? That's a huge part of horror films. Right, right, right. Is is this is the sadism and the, uh, the 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 masochism of the of the audience the need to be hurt by what you're creating. Yeah, there are, are those And then the inspiration there. to create other by art. Yeah. Yeah, well I think though there are audiences out there that do. They want to be they want their their filmmaker to hurt them, you know. Um films that hate you. Yeah, films that hate you. But but I think that it's uh uh it's important to to reiterate the idea that you can get these moments from from just about anything. Um uh, even films that don't necessarily feel like uh, look look at uh, the fire in Bambi. That's that's terrifying. Yes. Um, and can those th- same techniques be used in genre? Absolutely. I think so. Uh, How do you use Bambi in genre? Well, I think that you look look. This is going to be the weirdest correlation ever. But look at the forest fire scene in Bambi and then look at for example the scene in um, Devil's Rejects where they're tied to the chair and the, the, if the house is burning and you know what I mean same sort of thing proximity of fire not wanting to get burned running around trying to get out trying to get safe you know what I mean you uh, know, I think that you have cute wood- woodland creatures in Bambi and you have such affection for them because they're so small and innocent. And then you create something out of control. And we know that they're confused and we know right. that they're lost. And that sense of like hopelessness, because at least humans could maybe figure out a way through their panic to maneuver. Mm. It's just a feeling that these animals are trapped by nature itself. But by the time, you know, Otis uh, and company get tied to that chair, we're on board with them. There, there are cute woodland creatures, right? We're sort of yes. whether we want to or not, we're pulling for them to survive. Um, but I'm just saying that you can you can steal from just about anything, you know. Well, I would say Devil's Rejects is a, is not necessarily a gateway film, but important film because it shows you how far you could go into something that is projected on screen. That is, if you have the backing of a very good film company, mm-hmm. like Lionsgate. Yeah, you have the whole masturbation with a pistol scene. And when I saw that in a theater amongst civilians and I wasn't at a film fest, it's like, have we arrived? Well, well, look at this. Look at the, uh, the quote unquote head scene from reanimator, you know, very much that same thing. Like, Whoa. I think everyone in the world needs to watch reanimator. And when they're done watching (laughs) reanimator, they need to watch from beyond. Yeah. But Reanimator is also a film that's able to put comedy and horror together. But I think it's less about absurdity there Mm -hmm. and more centers around 
uh, a very eccentric character known as Herbert West. Well, and I also think that just there's they're they're te- they're playing it. They play it straight for the most part. There, there's not a lot of winking to the audience. There's not a lot of um, uh, getting getting cute with it, as I like to say. Um, there, he's there. The director's there. The the production's there to really creep you out and to really give you something that sort of um, that you haven't seen before. And there was plenty of that. Um, uh, the villain walking around with, you know, holding his head. That was, that's crazy. Um, I miss seeing things I haven't seen before. I think that's always a challenge to all filmmakers. I know. I know. I'm so, I'll be honest, over the last couple of years, I've become so bummed about just the state of film in general, because I'm not, I'm not having these moments anymore. Where well, I, I think you want to talk about the, the, the state of being, stoked by something because the visuals and the place it's going to take you to we haven't seen a thousand times before i think it's the idea of the visionary yeah you see a little of that now with people's reactions to the upcoming star wars films where you know the the groundswell is happening but um uh yeah i mean i i just love those i mean another film that's on my list that's not really genre but the 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 epiphany moment in Fight Club um, was buried so deep, and I know you're not such a big fan. <laughs> I, I'm not, because I think Fight Club is poser. Yeah, but the idea that there's that moment, uh, or even in Sixth Sense, that moment where you... But I'm not saying it's not shot well and it's not acted wonderfully. I just think it's message. Right. Well, let me, like I'll, I'll, use, I'll use Sixth Sense shit. instead. There's that moment where, as one, the audience goes, oh, and suddenly gets it. Uh, and is and is uh, the better for getting it? Um, I don't see that anymore. I would dare those people to watch Jacob's Ladder instead. Yeah, Jacob's which Ladder is, is which great. Is, which is, it's influential in a very insidious way because you'll see its corners at the edge of your periphery in some films. Mm-hmm. Oh, which reminds me, is a film that's not really spoken of so much, but all when I saw Seven. Absolutely. The credit sequence oh, absolutely. Be, will be influential to the day we die. And that that look and feel of the film, though it took years, has affected all of genre cinema. Absolutely. I, seven from stem to stern. Is the most influential modern horror film, I would say, when it comes to style. Absolutely. Of these films happening. That's when, that's when I mean, people are annoyed that the genre has, is color-coded, but I believe that stem from seven. Because there was very strong gels in films before that. But oh, sure. This sure. monotone, relentless. That sort of color. everything's blue. Yeah. Yeah. Or everything's green, or everything's brown. It's like it's like in um, Collateral. There's a lot of that. There's a lot of that sort of everything's gunmetal, you know, gray. Yes. You know. Um, so seven. Seven is important. Absolutely. Absolutely. God, uh, and then, I, then I want everybody to, if, when people are done watching Seven, then everyone has to see Dark City. Because those are beef <laughs> that people just don't talk about. That well, is the film that I just, the visuals. Right. Whether we want to admit it, it or not. Make sense. It may not make sense. Speaking of Proyas, we, I mean, whether we want to admit it or not, The Crow. I admit, I admit and love The Crow. The Crow is very authentic. I was a huge fan of it. I saw it in the theater with my father, who also liked it. So Joseph Buckley is a fan of The Crow. Nice. I don't necessarily know if it's influential. I would love to see something like The Crow be actually more influential than Dark City, because we're talking about this sort of stylized storytelling that we don't see unless someone says, I'm making Sin City and it's going to look like the comic. No one is looking at reality that The Crow is a comic, but The Crow's comic didn't look like that. Right. Right. It was a strange gothic approximation with an amazing soundtrack. And it was weird because it I'm used... I'm amazing soundtracks, by the way. It should be its own episode. Yeah, we'll do it. We'll do an episode. Because people, people talk about score, and it's like, that's awesome. I'm talking about, like, where is my Crow and Lost Highway soundtrack? Sure. And over and over and over again. And not even to relive that film, but to relive my own films that I'm playing in my head <laughs> since all those songs. I miss it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We will do a soundtrack show coming up. Uh, yeah. uh, 
which is also why Return of the Living Dead is very important because that's that's your touchstone for uh, absolutely for films. And, and then the, lot- big, mm-hmm. the big change when with you know Saturday Night Fever change that made that was the one that made soundtracks a thing. Yes, um, oh. and where it became a collection of pop tunes. I mean, look at yeah. Guardians of the Galaxy. That's a great soundtrack. That's a great soundtrack. Um, I'm going to throw out there two more titles just because, and this one has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but talk about an influential film, uh, Enter the Dragon. Uh, for my thoughts on Enter the Dragon, listen to our Bruce Lee episode, but for me, that was that was Ghoulies or <laughs> for you. It changed everything. Uh, Is it because of John Saxon? It was. It was because of John Saxon. No, it was just because it was like, oh my God, it was, I mean, we've talked about it before, but I thought, for me, that was really important, and I'm also going to throw out a film called uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show, which just celebrated Man. its 40th anniversary. I think that that is a film to see. I think it's a hard film to say that it influenced anything, because a lot of those horror musicals live within horror musical, I want to say jail, because it's <laughs> like they're, they're these beautiful diamonds that exist, yeah. away from one another, like Phantom of the Paradise, but I would consider like your gateway would actually be Rocky Horror Picture Show. Mm-hmm. But they can't influence anything because then you're going towards, well, it's a crazy horror musical. Right. And there's very few people that want to make crazy horror musicals. So it, so it, rules, it rules its world. But that sure. world is very small. I think it I is very about small. It's, and it's populated by things like Forbidden Zone. Which is great. Which is I great. Know, I don't know. Is our audience ready for us to suggest Forbidden Zone as a gateway drug? Because that's like the pixies of movies. <laughs> if you say, I like that, or like X, like I like Forbidden Zone, it's like you can walk away and win. You can win over Fan of the Paradise, mentioning that like you're influenced by Forbidden Zone. Yeah. That is an insane movie, a movie that uses blackface inappropriately. I don't know if it's offensive or not. But the thing that's uh, weird for me with a for- Forbidden Zone is there's this gen there's almost like a seventies porn sleaze to it in a weird way just from the way it's shot and the sets and the way everyone's the the the, the cast there's uh, a disgustingness about it I would use that word yeah and then there's uh, and then there's the music which borrows everything from Cab Calloway to you know old minstrel stuff it yeah definitely is a fusion. Absolutely. And it's, again, you know, I always hear people, you know, Rocky Horror is a given, but they always talk about Phantom of the Paradise, um, but Forbidden Zone and um, even Shock Treatment and some of the other, there were there were whole, sort of a whole sub, sub, sub genre of this stuff. Um, and Matt they're Monster super Party. weird. And they're, yeah. well, Man Monster Party wasn't super weird, but when there's humans involved in singing horror comedy things that they're doing it's very very weird and, and i wouldn't use the word surreal because they're not phantasmagoric maybe forbidden zone is phantasmagoric but i i, I wouldn't even have time to say that word and i would just go this is very weird yeah yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely and i've never seen something like this before which is important because i think a lot of our touchstone films is the first time actually you've seen something like that yeah, yeah. It's the yeah. first time you saw an, in, an intense cannibal film. The first time you saw someone stick a cock in someone's eye socket and talk about newborn porn. It's, it's the audacity mm-hmm. to do it for the first time. And I know we mentioned, like, Jaws not being on the table, but I know a lot of folks that are influenced by that. But that's the, it, that may have been people's first time of being deathly afraid of the water and still live with that for the rest of their lives. But, but, I can't think of any movie that's sort of scarier. But again, it's about the water. C- cultural, uh, culturally, the, uh, maybe open water I'll throw out there, maybe, sort of, kind of. But although open water borrows heavily from Jaws, um, the fact that people were, quote-unquote, afraid to go in the ocean, I mean, from a film, that's crazy. So, you know, maybe, maybe. Uh, but again, Jaws seems to me more like a filmmaker rite of passage than than a, than. You know, than a genre fan. It's like, um, but again, there's so much scary stuff. When you find that head, when they find that head at the bottom, when Hooper's uh, scuba diving, that's frightening. The girl in the beginning is frightening. 
Yes. Yeah. Um, and I'm looking one more. Do I want to mention anything else? Do you have anything you want to mention? We're running out of time. No, I think we came up with some good insights on this episode. The idea of the first, it's almost like your first love. It's the first time you saw something. It's like your first kiss when, right. when, when talking about different types of film. Yeah. Like you your know, first is, foo experience that really moved you. Your first werewolf. We haven't even brought any werewolves or vampires in here that really, that really moved you. But it's like, the, it's like God, it's like American Werewolf in London. You need to see that because you need to see what the pinnacle of all horror, of all werewolf transformations looks like. Sure. The yeah, best exactly. one we'll ever see and ever it's, will see. <laughs> it's, it's sort of like learning the the language of another world, you know what I mean, where where you you learn that shorthand. I was on a set once and the director was saying, hey, this is our chainsaw moment. And everyone on set knew exactly what he was talking about. So, you know, it's it's a way to sort of, you're learning the language, you know, um, in order to communicate not only with other fans, but, you know, filmmakers and just to discuss film in general. Yes. Yeah. I guess, yeah, these, these films also create the language of the horror fans as well. Exactly. That's my point. I totally, I totally get your point. I totally agree yeah. with your point. One thing I will say, my last thought on the musicals things, then we'll, we'll wind up, is that uh, we are not talking Repo the Genetic Opera or Devil's Carnival or that kind of thing, which is, seems to be, again, generation loss, that sort of copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. That, uh, yes. You know, where something and like... I, just, we, I think we've, we've seen, I mean, if we, we take this stuff aside, is that we, um, we've seen those visuals before. Yeah, and if you're gonna make a a musical, horror musical, we need to see different different films, and maybe that's that's what that's how we end. This is the gauntlet we throw down. It's like there's a lot of films out there that are sort of the synthesis and epitome of their genre or a type of film or point, and if the filmmaker would be so, we would ask them to create more. And I think what we're going to call these films, more iconic films. Yes. Because that's what these movies are. They're incredibly iconic. They're incredibly memorable. And they're made by human beings, just like me and you. So mm. go out there. Well, I think it's one of those things where filmmakers, it, my, my message to them would be like, look, if you even remotely can think of something similar, throw it out always operate from a from a place of originality that's, um, what I, that's what I do and a lot of people are afraid or scared that something out there is like your movie or not out like your movie I challenge myself I, as they say kill your darlings it's like what is there in the space of a like for example like Green Inferno what's out there now what do I do yeah to, to put my own mark on it because that's what I want to see because maybe I come from uh, loving a tour theory so much. It's like I would have loved to see what is someone's mark on bringing back a cannibal film in 2015. We've evolved a lot. We're going to see racism right. and xenophobia and homophobia in your film. So where can you bring it today? Why, Ted, how do you make it your own? And totally. the first answer to that is not by copying other people. But Johnny. definitely watching everyone's work. Watch Absolutely. all the cannibal films. Understand what they were trying to do and contextualize their place in history. Watch other extreme films. I love your documentaries. Absolutely. You know that would be that you could have do it. You could have totally done a a fa I mean, what is that's what it reminds me. Like, what is Cannibal Holocaust? Part of it is a found footage film mm -hmm. from back in the day before we were saturated in a market with with those films. Yeah, in fact, some would even say the first found footage film, but, you know. But, but I feel like, I think you hit it on the head, that if you look at what's been done, there are spaces. And how do you, your challenge is, how do you operate within that spaces, those spaces, and make something that is unique and uniquely your own? That's my challenge to people. So, so yeah. So there. Exactly. I want you to go out there and make great stuff. I want to be excited about movies again. I, I don't want to have to watch movies from the 70s and 80s. Don't make yeah. me watch television again. I want your slimy <laughs> monster movie. I do. This is yeah. all a drinking contest of the same movies I'm obsessed with. That's right. I want, I want, because that's the part of it. It's like, I want to be obsessed with your film. 
I want to own your film because I'll watch it seven times and, and show it to other people. But the films that I show to other people are not films that have come out in, in a contemporary modern time. Absolutely. And you know what? And, and it's I, not what they want to watch either because I'm not, say, I'm not forcing these films upon people. It's like, oh, we've heard of these legendary films, these iconic films. You have them. I want to watch them. Right. And it's like, let's watch them. Right, 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 right. Um, yeah, so I think we're good. I think we're good. So uh, Langley is, was away this week. He's in at a on a film shoot someplace in Seattle. I missed him. So he will I'm be back. He will be back next week. Um, we're all on Facebook. Find us on Facebook. Uh, I'm at TomCarnell.com. There's all the information there. Uh, Heather, you're on Tumblr. You're on Facebook. You're on Twitter. Yes, I'm uh, just, you can find me, Heather Buckley, there. I have a cute picture that someone drew of me with my uh, Buy Hawk up and information about buying We Are Still Here, which is out in stores, physical media. Yes. I think I'm in the supplement sections talking about FX shop supervision. Why not? And uh, on Twitter, I'm under slash Heather Buckley. Find me there. And uh, Tumblr, if you could find me, it's very naughty and dirty, so I don't know if you should. <laughs> I love your Tumblr. Your Tumblr is awesome. I uh, know that. Yeah. So, Many people uh, thank you also, for my Tumblr. <laughs> also, uh, go to Zed Presents. We, we, our publishing company has a bunch of stuff coming out, lots of coloring books. I have two books coming out within the next six months, so that, that, that's all there. Can so, you talk about your new coloring book coming out? We're doing uh, a Kickstarter now on fa a fairy tale book. We, we've got a goddesses book out. We've got a, a regional myths and legends book out. Um, there's a, uh, a fairy tale book, and we've got a bunch of other ones on their way. Um, I'm doing a short story collection and a couple of other things. So that presents is for all your, your, your needs. So, again... For the Bonus Material Podcast, I'm Tom Cornell. And I'm Heather Buckley. We'll see you next time. Stay scary.